This is Reformation Sunday. This is the Sunday that we, as a church, look back at what happened on that day when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the church at Wittenberg. And so what I want to do, I want to piggyback on uh, the, the Reader's Theater that they prepared this morning, and I, I want us to go back to school for a little bit, and we're going to talk about some history. How many history people do I have in the room this morning? How many people just, just you love history, it just lights you up? Comparatively, not as many as I would have hoped for. How many people, history just wasn't your thing? Okay, y'all can go. We're going we're gonna to be here for about a few. No, I'm just kidding. If, even, if, even if history wasn't your thing, it's important for us. You've heard the, you know, the, the, the old mantra, if you don't learn your history, you are doomed to repeat it. And what I'm going to throw to you guys this morning, to the church this morning, is the truth that because we have not learned our history, we are repeating it, specifically when it comes to the need for reformation. So let's talk a little bit this morning. Let's take a little journey through, through the history of Christianity. So in an epic moment for the beginning of the church, Christ rose from the grave in power and victory. He lived for a few more days here on earth, and he ascended to the Father in heaven. How many people were part of his church at that moment when he ascended into heaven? Anybody want to just throw out a guess? There were, there were a group gathered. There may have been more, but there were a specific number of people gathered together awaiting the promised Holy Spirit. There was 120 of them gathered, and they were waiting for this promised Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell on the church, and that really was the birth of the church, and all of a sudden, this movement exploded. Everywhere that you turn, people were coming to face faith in Christ from, from the lowest common people up until uh, people in, in positions of authority, and this movement began to spread. And so the Jewish people at that time tried their best to stamp it out. They wanted to stop this movement, and so they brought intense persecution against this early church? And did the persecution accomplish their goal? Did it stop the movement? Absolutely not. It did the opposite. It spread the movement. Now you see people, as they fled from persecution, they're going into all corners of the world, bringing the message of Christ with them. And you see little pockets of Christian communities uh, pop up in, in all across the Middle East, into Asia, into, down into Africa, into the Indian subcontinent, and even up into Europe. This began to spread and spread and spread. For the first few hundred years after Christ's ascension and after Pentecost, the church thrived. And they thrived under the leadership of who we call the church fathers. These were men like Ignatius and Polycarp and Jerome and some of these, some of these key leaders in the early church. And here's a couple of things that they did to help protect the church in these early days. One, they collected all the canon of Scripture together. They took all the books of, of Scripture, both Old Testament and as they were completed, the New Testament, and they compiled them together into one book, into one holy word. And so that was one of the greatest things that, this, that these early church fathers gave us. But they also codified Christian doctrine in a series of creeds and confessions. This was so important for these early Christians because most of them were illiterate. Most people in this day could not read, and so when they were giving, given a creed, a confession, or a song to sing, they could memorize those words and they could learn doctrine through that. We often, almost, I think about once a month or so, we confess the Apostles' Creed together here in this church, and so that, that's part of what they did. They also defended the faith against a number of heresies that, that began to spread. Here's what happened, though. As the church grew in size and political power, something began to happen. The focus began to shift from the small local church to the global church. And as that happened, as the global church grew, it became more of a political force than it did a religious movement. By the end of the first millennium, so talking about 1000 AD, the power of the church was firmly in the grasp of Rome, of the Catholic Church. Corruption was deep and widespread. By that point, for several hundred years, there was a period of intense spiritual darkness. And what didn't make sense, when you looked at it from the outside, the church was growing. The church was growing. They were sending missionaries to all corners of the world. The, 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 
the, the message was going out and people were becoming Christians. And, and most people, if you talk to most people in Europe, 90% or more would have confessed Christianity. Even in places like where, where my ancestors come from in the British Isles and then into the Nordic countries, those, those, those people that were staunchly polytheistic in their religion were converting. Countries were converting one by one. Christianity was growing, but the problem was faithful converts weren't being made. The gospel was all but hidden. God was preserving a very small remnant, but the church as it grew forgot its purpose and it became harder and harder to see the true gospel. In 1320, a man named John Wycliffe was born. This was a time when when the situation really was getting desperate. They talked about it in the skit, but the Bible was only available in one language at that time. What was that? Latin. And that was, the, that was the language of the mass. That was the language that Scripture was available in at that time. What's the problem, church? The Bible's there. Why can't people read it? Two reasons. Yeah, they couldn't read, for one. They were basically illiterate. And two, nobody spoke Latin. Can you imagine if you came to church? Just picture this for me, with me for a moment, church. How many of you guys have a copy of God's Word? Hold it up for me. Let me see it. How many of you guys got it on your phone? This morning, okay, you got a few on your phone. Um, how do you have multiple copies at home? Yeah, you got, you got multiple, maybe in different versions. We have a lot of different things. So we have our Bibles today. Imagine if you had this and you brought this, but you didn't have any idea what any of it said. Why would we bring it? Why would we read it? How could we read it? So what was happening, the Bible was written in Latin, but who were the only ones who could speak Latin? Latin was a dead language by this point. It wasn't spoken. So who were the ones who, who, who could understand it? The Catholic Church, the leadership of the church, the priests, and the cardinals, and those moving up. So this was a tremendous amount of power that these people held because they said, we're the only ones who know what Scripture says, and they held it out over the people. It was an intense time of oppression. So they, they, didn't, they, they didn't know the Scripture. They were biblically illiterate. Uh, biblical knowledge was just non-existent. Superstition and idolatry was widespread. Greed and manipulation were the standards of church leadership, and common people were oppressed by the very institution that Jesus had created to bring life. This was a dark, dark time. And that is when the reformers came on the scene. John Wycliffe was born in 1320, and we call him uh, the the, the proto-reformer or the first reformer. He was the first one to begin to fight for change. And that's what it was. It wasn't, it wasn't just Clint and I having a, like an argument and a discussion and I'm saying I'm right and you're saying you're right. It was more than that. Josh Bice is a pastor and he said this, the Reformation is more than a historical skirmish over words. At the heart of the controversy is the very gospel of Jesus Christ itself. So they, were, they, they took this and they realized that if I dissent here and if I fight back, it is going to probably cost me my life. This is what we've been celebrating. This is what we've been talking about all month. Men like John Wycliffe, Jan Hus, Martin Luther, John Calvin, and John Knox. This is what they did. They recaptured the truth of the gospel. They made the scripture more widely available in the language of the people. They fought against corruption and oppression, and they reclaimed sound doctrine for the church. Now, 500 years have passed. 506 years have passed since Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the door of the church. And I I, want to look at a couple of things this morning before we open Scripture up. We today, I believe, are living in a a very, very similar time and culture to the time that the Reformers came on the scene. Okay? We, for the most part, you look at East Texas, and I think you could say the same thing about medieval Europe, right? We're, We're Christian. You look around, how, have you met a, a, anybody really in this area who would not confess to be a Christian? Now, let's be real careful with this because it's one thing to say it with your mouth. It's another to prove it by your, the way that you live your life. But most people around here, you meet a person, are you a Christian? Yeah, I've been a Christian my whole life. You know, I got baptized when I was a kid. That's usually the comments that I hear about this. The problem is we're living in in the same time. Christian culture is largely the same culture as the culture that Martin Luther grew up in. And we don't want to believe it, church. We want to say we're thriving over here. Look at all this. Look, we, We got a new speaker of the house, and he's an evangelical Christian, so things must be going well. Church, come on. Look at all these things. The, the church, the medieval church was 
functionally, biblically illiterate. And I want to throw this to you, the same thing. Many, many, if not most people in the church have no idea what the scriptures say. And, I, and, and I'm not attacking you. I hope you're not like, oh, oh ouch, you know. I, maybe I didn't read my Bible this week. But you don't have to yell at me. Listen, this, this 74% of American households say they own a copy of God's Word, but 11% said they read it in the last year. So we've got a, a people who claim to love Scripture but have no idea what it really says. And that's why we're waffling on all sorts of issues. We're biblically illiterate. We've got a people, maybe we're not so superstitious as we used to be, but we're no less idolatrous than the people were in medieval Christianity. We have set up our idols, and they are causing us to worship them instead of the true God. We're living in the same time period. Okay, so you say, well, but we're not selling indulgences, right? They talked about this, an indulgence was a certificate that uh, you could purchase with money and then be insured salvation for yourself or, or, or for somebody in your family. We're not doing that anymore. Like, you can't buy your salvation. Listen, if you look at the largest churches in America, they are built on the greed and the manipulation of the prosperity gospel. And what does the prosperity gospel teach you? That if you sow a seed, if you just give financially, God's going to give you all the blessings that you ever dreamed of. It's, it's different than indulgences, but it's the same greedy, manipulative spirit at the heart of greedy, manipulative leaders who all they want is your money. We're going to talk about this in a little bit, but the fact is, the largest churches in America, all you got to do is look at their pastors and look at where they live. Come on, living in a $50 million mansion, there's something wrong here. And so we're living in the same time period. We look and we say, well, they fought against false doctrine. What false doctrine is going through the church? Every false doctrine is going through the church. 40,000 Christian denominations in the world right now bickering and fighting over all kinds of different doctrinal disagreements. Church, we're living in the same time period. So what's the solution? <laughs> what do we do? Do, do, we need, do we need men like Martin Luther? Is that who we need? Do we need to somehow invent a time machine, go back to 1517 and say, Luther, you were needed then, but you're more needed now, and, and kind of take them and, and build up a new, a, a new reformation? Is that what we need, church? We need a new reformation? No, the solution is the same. We don't need a new reformation. We need the same reformation. We're in the same culture. We need the same kind of men to bring the same message because the answer, church, you're holding it in your hands right now. It's the word of God. That's the answer. The answer, the answer to biblical illiteracy, what is it? The word. The answer to idolatry and, and, and disobedience to, to scripture, what is the answer? The word. All of these things, it comes down to this. And what I want to talk about this morning is renewed focus on faithful biblical teaching. That, 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 to me, that's when we look at what the church needs moving forward. We don't need new methods. We don't need new trends. We don't need new, uh, new tools and new things. I see every single day I get an email in my inbox, hey, five simple st steps to, to grow your church, five, t ten key things that are going to make your church attendance explode. We keep repeating this over and over and over and over, creating people who like Jesus and orbit around Jesus but are not faithful disciples. We need a renewed focus on faithful biblical teaching. The heartbeat of the Reformation was the gospel. Return to the gospel. Let's go to scripture. Let's go to the gospel. There was a late reformer, and he has the best name in history, Jodocus von Lodenstein. Okay? If, you're, if you're currently pregnant and looking for baby names, I'm going to throw out Jodicus von Lodenstein. You can call him Yoda for short. It's just, it's a, you win either way you go. But this is what he wrote. He wrote this in Latin. He said this, Ecclesia semper reformanda est, which means the church must be always reforming. The idea is not that we need a brand new reformation. We need a reformation that has continued, the same reformation that's continued for 500 years. So that's what we're going to do. We no not need a change in style or culture or innovation or trend but a renewed focus on faithful biblical teaching. That's what I want to do. Let's open up God's Word. It all starts in God's Word. We're going to look at the book of Psalms. Psalm number 119. If you would gather with me around Psalm 119. This is the longest chapter in Scripture. It's the longest of the Psalms. It's a masterpiece of Hebrew poetry. Every single verse is dedicated to the glory, the beauty, the effectiveness 
the perfection and the wonder of God's word. How many verses are in this psalm? 176. As I was preparing, I thought, how long would it teach me, take me to teach through 176 verses? So I did some math. We did some history this morning. I did some math. In my pastoral ministry, I've preached 9,010 verses, and that has taken me 27,335 minutes to preach across 781 sermons. So that is about three minutes it takes me to teach one verse. And there are 176 verses, so that would take me a little under nine hours at my current average to, uh, to teach through this. We're not going to do that. I just want to look at four verses this morning, so you can do the math on that. Um, and math is a silly thing anyway. You don't need to look at numbers. If you say, he's got to be done in 12 minutes, that's what he said. He said three minutes per verse. We've got we to gotta keep moving on there. Now look with me, Psalm 119, verse 133. Remember, every verse is about God's word. Every verse is a potential push toward reformation. I'm going to look at verses 133 through 136 this morning. If you would stand with me to give honor to the reading of God's word. And church, let's not miss this and let's not take it for granted that we're going to read this this morning in a language that you understand. And if even if you're sitting here this morning saying, well, I, maybe English isn't your first language, maybe something else, and I guarantee you there is a copy of Scripture in your heart language. Uh, Clint, how many languages are on the, on the app for the Gideons? 1,100 languages. In one app, you can, you can look at Scripture. Scripture is available, and, and this is largely because of men like Martin Luther and John Calvin and John Knox who translated scripture into these different languages. Psalm 119, 133, it says this, Make my steps steady through your promise. Don't let any sin dominate me. Redeem me from human oppression, and I will keep your precepts. Make your face shine on your servant and teach me your statutes. My eyes pour out streams of tears because people do not follow your instruction. I'm going to end right there. I know that there's so much more before and after, but I really want to hone in on these four verses this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you on this Reformation Sunday. We thank you so much that you sent men like Luther and Calvin and Knox and Zwingli and Philip Melanchthon and Peter Chalchitsky and um, Lord, all the different reformers that, that came on the scene who literally many of whom gave their very lives in defense of the gospel. Lord, we're not asking for a new reformation. We are asking you to give us the strength to continue the reformation that was started 500 years ago. Lord, we confess before you that though we love Scripture, we, many, many of us, are functionally biblically illiterate. We don't know your word like we should. We should be studying it every day. We should be, like, like David said, eating it like, like honey and savoring the sweetness of the word that you have given us. But we neglect and ignore it again and again and again. And I ask you for forgiveness for that. Even the scripture we know, we don't obey. And we're wrapped up in idolatry and false doctrine. And I pray, Lord, that you would use the word as, uh, Lord, a, a measuring stick to show us where we have erred, and where we need to come back. I pray that we would walk in holiness according to your word. I pray that we would behold the truth and the treasure of the gospel this morning, and that it would, it would light us ablaze just like it did Luther when he read that the just will live by faith. I pray, Lord, that those in this room who are justified freely by your grace in Christ Jesus, that you would reignite in us a passion for the word. And Father, we ask all these things knowing that it's only possible because Jesus lived the righteous life we could never live and died the substitutionary death that we deserved. He did that for us, Lord, so that we could come before you justified, being sanctified, and going to be glorified. Lord, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I don't have points this morning. I have a point, but just don't, don't have specific fill-in-the-blank points. I just want to walk through these verses one by one. So look at verse 133 with me. Make my steps, what, church? Steady 
through your promise. Don't let any sin dominate me. This, this, without, we've got to understand this, without faithful biblical instruction, this is the next logical step. If churches aren't preaching truth, then the next logical step is that sin will dominate us. The word literally means to have dominion over. And I think this is honestly why so many churches struggle and fail, because we have a very weak message. We have a message that, that uses scripture. Maybe, maybe somebody reads a couple of verses, and then they move on to other things, and we don't, we don't hear true teaching. And then we wonder why people's lives are dominated by sin. We wonder, we, we say, I, I don't understand this. I prayed a prayer when I was a kid. I, I had I had my, my little you know my little Bible you get at a baby dedication. I carried that. I got baptized. Old brother, whoever baptized me, and, and I, I shouldn't that have just transformed my entire life? Listen, you, you, you don't you don't you don't jump in the pool in the deep end and then wonder why you're drowning if you don't know how to swim. Right? We we open God's word and we learn and it grows us as we walk through it faithfully. Without teaching, sin will dominate us. It, it's not an automatic thing. You don't come to faith in Christ and then say, I'm good. All my problems will all disappear now and I don't have to deal with any struggles for the rest of my entire life. No, the rest of your life is struggle against sin. And how are we strengthened? By God's word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So the vast majority, I think what happens is that because we think people just need to be saved and that'll solve the problems, the vast majority of churches' energy and resources go to, to seeing converts made. Go to seeing people say yes. Just say yes to Jesus. Just, just raise your hand and then you'll be saved. And what happens then are converts are being made, but disciples are not. What did Jesus instruct us to do, church? What was his last and great commission to us? Go into all the world and make what? Disciples. But we've settled for converts. We've settled for decisions. We've settled for cards, checks saying, I want to become a follower of Jesus. Well, how do you make disciples? You can make a convert really easily, but how do you, how do you, how do you make disciples? He goes on to say, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and what? Teaching them to observe all the things whatsoever I have commanded you. How do we know today whatsoever he has commanded us? I'm leading you, leading the witness here. The Word. We go back to the Word. How do we grow? How do we become disciples? We go back to the Word again and again and again. The heart of a faithful church is semper reformanda, always reforming. And faithful biblical instruction has got to be at the center point of it. There's a lot of churches, I'll say this even, uh, I, I saw some, some pictures today in a, in a Facebook post of different churches and their pulpits, okay? And I'm going to harp just for a second, okay? Can I do that? Can I just go for a second? There's a lot of weird-looking pulpits around, okay? You remember how pulpits used to look? Have you ever seen a picture of how John Calvin preached in his church in Geneva? It was up this big winding staircase, and it was this, this giant balcony that he would preach from. It was pretty neat. So that has kind of been reduced and reduced and reduced to the point of a, kind of a traditional pulpit like this. But this is disappearing, isn't it? You see more people just kind of casually walking around or having a, maybe a little table or a little clear plexiglass stand. Why do we put a pulpit in the middle of our, our platform here? Because I have so many notes, I need to spread it across a bigger wide surface. No, because this is central, church. We, when, when you look up here at, at this place, this is not a stage. This is a platform. If it was a stage, that means we're performers, and that's not what we want. You are not an audience. You are the faithful congregation of the church. We put this here, and we like a big classic one because it shows the primacy of the preaching of God's word. That's what this is about. We, we don't need new methods. We don't need new things. We need what God gave us at the very beginning, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. The heart of a church is faithful biblical instruction. And this is what David says in verse 133. He says, God, your, your promises steady my feet. Your promises are a firm foundation that when I'm standing upon them, no matter what happens in this world, the world shakes and quakes and, and, and it, it, it's all going down in this horrible spiral toward hell. If I'm standing on your word, I will not be shaken. His word is a firm foundation beneath our feet. Look at verse 134. It continues. If God's word is our foundation, then what? Redeem me, verse 134, from human oppression and I will keep your precepts. If this wasn't the rally cry of the Reformation, I don't know what is. This was a huge part of the, the Reformation. Wresting control away from power-hungry and greedy grip of the church and giving it back to the people. When you can't read Scripture for yourself, what are you relying on? 
You're relying, I mean, so this morning, if you, if you had no ability to read the scripture, you'd be relying just on my, on my words, that they were true, and often they weren't. The people in positions of leadership was, were manipulative. The church held unimaginable power over common people. They controlled their lives from beginning to end. It was in the grip of the church. And if you had the audacity to speak out against the church, what was going to happen? What's been the story of all our reformers so far? Every single one of them. We taught Chloe. Chloe, where are you? Over there. We taught her a new word as we started going through the videos that we've been making, the word heresy. The church declared, hey, if you disagree with us, then you're a heretic. And, and they put men like John Wycliffe on trial, and they said, you're a heretic. They put men like Jan Hus on trial, and they said, you're a heretic. They put men like Martin Luther on trial, and they said, you're a heretic. All of them were condemned to death. That, 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 that was the grip of a, a manipulative and greedy and power-hungry church. They said, if you dissent, we're going we're gonna to silence you in any way that we can. Either we're going to excommunicate you and say that you'll have no place in heaven, or literally, they would take their lives. Priests and clergy during the medieval times, I want you to see, were becoming massively wealthy. I mean, opulently wealthy. They were some of the biggest landowners in Europe, were the people that God had called and set up to be shepherds over his people. So they were living in extreme wealth while the people in their parishes were literally starving to death. And tell me that's not still happening, church. Come on. Man. Have you ever seen Joel Osteen's house? I know, I know I pick on him. I know, but my job is to point out wolves in sheep's clothing and false teachers where I can. When you live in a, in a $50, $60 million mansion, the biggest mansion in the woodlands, and yet your people are struggling to make ends meet, and, and, and you keep telling them again and again, just sow a seed. Have more faith. Sow a little bit more. Give a little bit more, and God's going to bless you. That's not God's blessing. That's man's greed leveraged against desperate people. But verse 134 shows this. God's word, his precepts, that's what rescues us and guards us from oppression and manipulation. Church, I, I pray, I, I pray this every week, that you don't, that you don't ever see in me, in, in any form, some kind of manipulation. I, I pray that you don't see that. I'm not trying, that, that's why we don't make a big practice about talking about money. And, and I know people want me to. I know they say, well, if we, if we just talked a little bit more about money, then maybe our offerings would go up and we, and we could you know, cover, cover everything a little bit more effectively. Listen, I don't do that because of this reason. I don't, I, I don't want you to ever think that's why I'm here. I'm here for your spiritual well-being. That's all I care about. I, I care this morning. I, I want you to know Jesus Christ, and I want you to grow in him as the word is taught. That, that, that's my focus as we go through this. Rescue us and guard us, redeem us from oppression Manipulation. Verse 135, let's keep walking. I love this verse. Make your face shine on your servant and teach me your statutes. Make your face shine. This isn't a phrase that we use really anymore in, in modern uh, vernacular, but in Hebrew poetry, this was something really, really special. Church, every single morning at about 6 o'clock, you're going to find me in a very specific place. I get up early and I go before the sun rises to McMillan Park and I go and I... I run or walk a few miles around the, the pond. One of my favorite moments just in my, in my every day is watching the sunrise over the water. And I don't know about you, maybe you're not a morning person, you say, that sounds like a nightmare, getting up before the sun. Like, humans aren't supposed to be up then. But listen, getting to see that, because when you're first walking out there and it's pitch black out there, and then slowly you start to see the world come alive and you start to see color and you start to see different, uh, you hear the animals uh, start coming out and you hear the birds chirping. You see God paint the clouds with these beautiful colors of sunrise. That's my favorite moment of the day. Watching God saying, listen, with this new sunrise, my mercies are new for you each and every morning. I love that moment. And that's the heart of this, is that the, in, in this time, he's saying, Lord, shine your face on us. Shine your light on us. We're living in darkness, and we need the light of your word to shine on us. That's exactly what happened in the time of the Reformation. It was a, a period of intense spiritual darkness, and God shone his face. He, he, he shone, shone the light of the gospel on them, and that's what we need today. If you, if, if looking today at, at our, the political landscape, church, you say, if all, if we could just elect the right people, if we could just get them in office, then things would change. Church, we, we, don't, we don't need that. We don't need new innovations. We don't need new people in office. What we need is God's face to shine on his people. And that happens when we go to his word and we're taught his statutes.
They go hand in hand, right? God's face shining down, God's smile on his people, and God's word being taught. Last verse, let's go through 136. My eyes pour out streams of tears because people do not follow your instruction. This is my heart for us moving forward, and this is where I want to conclude this morning. This is the attitude and the mindset I want you to, to leave with. I think sometimes we come to church for a quick pick-me-up and say, I want to be encouraged and let's go home so I can conquer my week. I just want a, a quick injection of B12, you know, Bible 12, and then we just go and we can get, oh, that was bad. Oh, that was a bad one. But listen, I, I think we, we're going at this the wrong way. When we gather as Christ's church, we have a mandate to lift the name of Jesus high, to study his word, to give him praise, to commune together, to understand that we are in this together. You're never alone. So if you're struggling this morning, you say, I don't, I don't know, I, I'm, not, I'm not in the word like I should be. I'm not praying like I should be. I'm not sharing my faith like I should be. I'm the one that you're talking about. I need a reformation in my life. Listen, we're in this together. We're in this together. And the, thing, the two things I want to call you to this morning, based on 136 here, is first to lament. He says, my, my eyes pour out streams of tears. We should be ashamed of the state of the church in America right now. Uh, one, one guy on Twitter said, I, I read his quote yesterday, he said, I would be ecstatic and I, I long for a Christianized nation. But then he said, but I would settle for a Christianized church. We, we, we should go to the Lord today even pour out with sorrow, cry out to Him and say, Lord, I, I, we are not the people that You've called us to be, but make us that people. Draw us to Yourself. Draw me to Yourself, Lord. Show me the true Gospel. Cry out with broken hearts to God that He hear and answer our prayers and shine His face on us. Cry out with sorrow over the disobedience and neglect of God's Word. Lament sin in your life, but don't let it end there. I think we can end in a, in, in a cycle of sorrow and, and we can just always just cry over the, the current situation. Lamentation should lead to the second thing, repentance. Vody Bauckham said this, repentance isn't when you cry, it's when you change. May our tears of lament lead our hearts to repent, to change direction. All right, church, listen. Four problems that we talked about in, in our Christian culture today. Biblical illiteracy. What's the solution? The word. Faithful biblical instruction. Okay? Uh, idolatry is, is running rampant through the church. What's, what's the solution? It's the word. Faithful biblical instruction. Uh, greed and manipulation in top levels of leadership. What's the solution? The word. False doctrine being taught. What's the solution? I hope you get the pattern that we've arrived at here. It's the Word. It's faithful biblical instruction. It all leads us to the same place. We meet with the Savior in His Word. David here talks about four things. God's promise, God's precepts, God's statutes, and God's instruction. What was his focus? The Word. Lord, I want Your Word to be what sustains me and saves me and redeems me and steadies my feet. God's Word was His focus and it has to be our focus as well. Semper reformanda means always reforming. We are not asking for a new reformation, we're carrying the reformation forward, and it starts with faithful biblical instruction. I'm going to ask our praise team to come up. Church, we're going to pray, and then I just want to respond in song. I just want us to sing to the Lord this morning, thanking Him first for the gift of His Word that He's given, second for the gift of His Son that He has given us, and if you don't know Jesus is your Savior, then what a, there's no better day to come than Reformation Sunday and make sure that your heart is right with Jesus this morning. And I'm not going to manipulate you. I don't, I don't want you to, to think that I'm the one who has all the truth. You have it in your hand. You hold it in, in your hand. The power of God to salvation is the gospel, and that's what we're not ashamed of. If you don't know Jesus is your Savior, run to the truth and the good news of the gospel that you're a sinner separated from a holy God but Jesus died to justify and redeem you if you cry out to him and ask him to save you he promises that he will so I'm not even going to ask you to come forward this morning all I want to say is if you don't know Jesus is your savior cry out to him from wherever you are ask him to save you and if you already are saved if you're a believer this morning let's sing a song of praise to the Lord Let's, let's go to him in prayer father we love you and we thank you you are good and gracious and holy and righteous and just you could have looked at us in our state of sin and you could have poured your wrath out on us. But instead, you poured your wrath out on Jesus in our place. 
so that we could come to you sola gratia, by grace, sola fide, through faith, solus Christus, in Christ, sola scriptura, according to the scripture, and all soli deo gloria, for your glory alone. Lord, we come to you as recipients of the, the Reformation message, thanking you that you used men like that, but not praising those men. We praise you and you alone. You are the one at the heart of our redemption, and so we praise you this morning. We thank you. We glorify you. If somebody in this room doesn't know you as their Savior, I pray that they, Lord, heard this message and uh, have, have turned toward you in faith and repentance. Father, we, we just we give you glory. That's what we want to do as we sing. We pray that this song would rise to you as, as an offering. And I pray, Lord, that you would receive this, this gift of our worship. We ask all these things in the blessed, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.